Great, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to the organizers for including me and letting me speak today. Um, certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has turned our world upside down. It's exposed and exacerbated existing inequalities. And importantly, it's not just the pandemic or the virus itself, but how states have responded to the pandemic that is impacting human rights and HIV. Early in the uh, COVID response, UNAIDS received various reports of lockdowns negatively impacting people living with and vulnerable to HIV. And in response, we undertook a study in Latin America and the Caribbean and in Sub-Saharan Africa to map out some of these impacts. The results were released in our report, Rights in a Pandemic, along with 10 recommendations. And overall, I think the message for resiliency for today is certainly if we recognize problems that are difficult, we can respond with conviction and compassion and overcome some of these difficulties to make our communities more resilient. So today I'll highlight just a few key findings. First, the COVID-19 pandemic is indeed, as we've heard today already, interrupting the provision of HIV and other services. Lockdowns and travel restrictions have affected the production of HIV commodities, their transport to countries. Health clinics, including harm reduction clinics, have closed or reduced their hours. Lockdowns also mean sometimes that community-led service delivery is threatened when community providers are too often not des designated as essential workers, leaving them trapped at home and unable to reach clients. So we early on said, how bad could this get? And modeling by the HIV Modeling Consortium in collaboration with the World Health Organization and UNAIDS found that a six month interruption of HIV treatment could lead to 500,000 extra deaths from AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa alone in just one year. This is a doubling of deaths. It takes us back to 2008 mortality levels. We could lose a decade of progress in just one year. Fortunately, it's our collective job to ensure that doesn't happen. And that's some of the solutions you're gonna hear about in the rest of this session. We've indeed seen some important responses, movements on policies and implementation of strategies like multi-month dispensing, creative responses of community-led and faith-based organizations, and of course, so many of your faith-based service providers who've continued to deliver HIV services during this time, often still without sufficient supports or even sufficient PPE. Second thing we found is that poor human rights responses are exacerbating human rights barriers to accessing services. Coercive and punitive responses, as we have seen, are likely to push people underground, disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable and creating additional harms. Yet many countries in this uncertainty have turned to criminal law to achieve public health ends. We've seen extrajudicial killings of people for allegedly breaching movement restrictions. We've seen targeting of sex workers and LGBTI communities by police. We've seen taxi drivers who were arrested and beaten for driving pregnant women to the hospital. People are unsure if they can safely leave their house in some places to access healthcare, while others cannot leave their house to provide them. But this need not happen. It's a myth that there must be a trade-off between public health and human rights. In fact, as Winnie started with, the only effective public health approach is a human rights-based approach. We can have restrictions, but they must be evidence-based, time-limited, subject to review, and make accommodations for the most vulnerable so that they are not further harmed. Third thing we learned is that COVID is exacerbating those inequalities that specifically increase vulnerabilities to HIV. Reports of violence against women have increased in every country we reviewed. We've seen punitive approaches to sex workers that are making them less safe and less able to protect themselves from HIV. Yet despite the pressures that countries are facing, we also found examples of countries working hard to support communities. Early on, governments recognized the need for exceptions for medical care, food, and water, and have been quick to respond to some of the unintended negative impacts of the early lockdown policies. 15 out of 16 countries have released people from prisons. The community structures and faith-based structures activated for the HIV response have proven incredibly effective at responding to both the threat of COVID-19 and also the HIV disruptions. 
For example, communities are providing home deliveries of methadone for people who use drugs or are working with motorbike riders to deliver medicines to remote areas. So we drew upon the experience of the HIV response to provide 10 recommendations. And I'll highlight just two here. First, work with communities as partners in the COVID-19 response. Communities, including faith communities, have the knowledge, the connections, and the solutions that we need to ensure a human rights-based response. Second, taking an enabling rather than a punitive approach. Work with people to find solutions so they can physically distance safely and effectively while still accessing the basic necessities of life. In both, faith-based communities and leaders have a critical role to play. As service providers, you are able to mobilize to ensure the continuity of HIV services and to support broader needs of the most vulnerable, shelter, food, access to water. But your voices are also strong, strong and meaningful advocates to push back against coercive and punitive approaches that harm the most vulnerable and to fight against stigma, both against COVID-19 and HIV. So as leaders and communities, most of all, we need your voice to make sure that HIV remains on the political agenda and that while we are facing these converging epidemics, we make sure our efforts to fight both epidemics work together so that as we respond to COVID-19, we also move forward in ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030.